Welcome to the second part of the lecture series on Windows 10. So we'll start with the file system. So the fundamental structure of the Windows 10 file system, which again kind of draws from the NTFS file system, which was part of Windows NT. So uh, the key idea is a volume. So volume can be created by the Windows 10 disk administrator utility. It essentially encapsulates a logical disk partition. So for us, as far as we are concerned, at least virtually about a file system. So the volume is basically, as I was discussing, a virtual file system. It is not really tied to the underlying storage in the sense it may occupy portions of a disk. It may occupy an entire disk or may even occupy, it may even span across several disks. So all of that could together be a volume. So the software would still see a volume as a volume, which is a logical file system, regardless of its underlying storage. And every volume would have some information about it known as the metadata, which will store information about the volume. This metadata will be stored in a regular file. So uh, what NTFS does is it uses clusters, something that we have previously referred to other in other operating systems as sectors. NTFS uses clusters for the underlying unit of uh, disk allocation. So a cluster is basically a number of disk sectors, consecutive disk sectors, to the power of two, let's say two, two raised to the power k disk sectors. And it is smaller than the minimum size, the, the minimum cluster size of the, you know, the erstwhile old 16-bit FAT file system. So this uh, further ensures the amount of internal fragmentation, which is the space wasted inside a storage unit like a cluster is reduced. So we have two raised to the power k sectors, and this is a cluster. And for the file system, a cluster is the basic unit, right? It is the basic atom of storage in the file system. So the two key points or the takeaways are the term cluster, which we just defined, and a volume, which is a logical file system, which is kind of unrelated to the underlying storage in the sense that it could be part of a disk and it could also be multiple disks. So the internal layout is like this, that the NTFS file system has this term called a logical cluster number or an LCN, which is pretty much does the job of a disk address. So as we have seen, the basic atom of storage or the basic unit of storage is a cluster. The address of the cluster is basically an LCN, a logical cluster number. And that to us represents the logical address, the, the disk address. So a file in NTFS is not a simple byte stream, right? So it is not, uh, you know, uh, the way in Unix as we consider just a file as a dumb array of bytes, it is not really that. It is instead the file is an object which has a structure. So the file has a structure. It has a set of attributes. So a file itself is treated more like an object where the content of the file is essentially one of the fields in the file. But there are other fields the user, creator, data modification, and so on. And the entire file is an object. And it is mapped to physical addresses on the disk using these LCNs or logical cluster numbers. So in NTFS, we have a master file table, which pretty much records the location of each of the files on the disk or on the underlying storage, whatever it is. And it is described by one or more records in an array. And this array itself is stored in the master file table. So every file on an NTFS volume has two things. It has a unique ID and it has a file reference. So the file reference is nothing but the object handle that we have been talking about in the past. The unique ID is a 64-bit quantity, which ensures that in practice, we can support a very, very large number of files. The unique ID contains a 48-bit file number and a 16-bit sequence number. And furthermore, we can also perform internal consistency checks both on the file as well as on the file system structure. 
So the main aim of the 48 bit file number and the sequence number are like this. That of course 48 bits is a very large number which means we can support a large, large, large number of files. But the key point is that let's say we delete a file and we create a new one, what would really happen? So what would really happen is that, well, uh, we can do that. So then it will mean that the file number of that file will be unused, right, will sort of be removed from the master file table. We will then have a counter and increment it and get one more reference, right? So, so get an unused file number and use it. So this can be done. Uh, but what NTFS does is that it slightly optimizes this process. So it does not create very large holes uh, in the ID space. So it will basically reuse a 48-bit file number, something that was, let's say, deleted, will again be reused as a file number of some other file which is being created. But then how do we differentiate between them? Otherwise, an old access might try to read it. But the way we will differentiate is using this sequence number. Right, And uh, so this kind of helps us to sort of uh, optimize this process a little bit and not just uh, create a new file, uh, you know, a new file number for every new file that we create. So the NTFS uh, namespace is organized pretty much like a database in the sense we have directories and then we have their children and so on. You know, it's like a tree-like structure. For the same way like we have in databases, we have a B plus tree to identify a file within a directory. So the file system is, uh, is structured like a log structure journaling file system to enable more reliability. So before any data structure, which will be in this case a file related data structure is altered, the transaction will write a log record that contains all the information that uh, we are actually adding. In the sense, it will contain all the redo and undo information of how exactly the contents of the file or its metadata are being changed. After this data structure has been changed, we create a commit record in the log, which is a small commit record. So it can be written quite quickly as opposed to a file system action to signify that the transaction has, has succeeded and gradually this log, you know, these, uh, this log, which has a lot of these entries, it is flushed to the disk. So after a crash, the file system data structures can be restored to a consistent state by essentially processing the log records. So if let's say we had uh, several unused, sorry, not unused, but several unflushed uh, logs, right, unflushed records, then Essentially, we can go to the disk, we can look at its state and flush all of them. So this will create a consistent state, which means it will be the same state at which the system was before it crashed. What is the advantage of the log? Well, the advantage of the log is it's, uh, it's in memory, so it's very quick. So we just write to the log and come back. And the log is gradually flushed to the disk. And of course, we have different methods of ensuring that we don't lose the contents of this log. So this is a very standard technique. It's known as a journaling file system, which is essentially there in Windows 10. So the key point is that, you know, you need some crash consistency semantics in the sense that, let's say, if there is a crash, then what exactly are we going to keep? What exactly are we going to lose or we may lose? So Windows 10 does not guarantee that all user file data can be recovered after a crash because this will really increase the response time uh, significantly, which means that we will not be able to write to a file until its contents have been purged to a disk. And that is going to make things quite slow. So what instead is guaranteed is that the key data structures, the key system data structures, such as the metadata files, they can be recovered in an undamaged state. And we'll have a consistent file system state in the sense it will not really have a problem. So what is a consistent file system state? Well, it's a correct state where essentially if there is, let's say, some entry in the metadata file, the corresponding file exists. And no file exists without an entry. So these simple correctness properties hold. So the key idea to having correct metadata is the log. 
and the log itself is stored in a third metadata file within the volume. And Windows takes special care to ensure that at least the key data structures of the file system, they are, you know, they are kept consistent such that a crash cannot really destroy them because if the file system gets corrupted, pretty much the entire machine is gone. And there is a Windows 7 log file service which does this process of logging. So I hope that it is clear to most people who are uh, listening to this video that you can sacrifice an individual file, but do not sacrifice the full file system. Because if the full file system is corrupted, then the system will be unusable because we'll pretty much lose all the files. So if some sacrifice has to be done, it should be done for a single file or a few files. But otherwise, the metadata of the entire file system should be kept in a correct and consistent state. So with regards to security of the file system, so window, there is a standard Windows 7 object model that we have discussed in the past where uh, you know, we have access control lists. Something similar is used where every file object has a descriptor attribute which is stored in its record. What does this attribute contain? It contains the access token of the owner of the file. See, if let's say someone wants to access the file and make some changes which the owner can, then we will check if it has the owner's access token. Along with that, there is an access control list for every file object. So this has the access privilege uh, privileges that are granted to other users, right? Uh, so basically all the access privileges that other users have, including the owner, and also to groups of users. So mind you, in Windows, after Active Directory has come, all the groups of users need not have accounts on the same machine. They could have accounts on different machines as well. Now let's come to management of the volume and overall fault tolerance. So similar to uh, the check disk command in uh, Linux, we have a fault tolerant disk driver for Windows whose job is to essentially uh, sorry, I stand corrected. Check disk does something else. Incidentally, we have check disk in Windows, but let's look at FT disk. So, FT disk is the fault tolerant disk driver on Windows 7, which is also there in Windows 10. What that does is it, it has a method, it has an algorithm to take multiple disks, in this case, SCSI disk, where SCSI is a disk uh, access and disk protocol. So, we can combine them and create one large logical volume. So in a sense, this logical volume is also called, uh, you know, is a multi-disk volume. We also call it a volume set where we can use the traditional RAID mechanisms. So go back to the chapter on hard disks where we discussed RAID. So we could have RAID level zero where we have a interleaving, we interleave the multiple physical partitions in a round robin fashion. In a sense, you know, we store let's say uh, cluster zero here, cluster one here and so on. Uh, the other is that we also do some mirroring in the sense that uh, we can mirror the disk such that there is some degree of fault tolerance. So basically a RAID can, uh, this is software RAID, but software RAID can also pair with hardware RAID and uh, this can be used to increase the reliability of a given volume. Because particularly when we are dealing with multiple disks, we don't want one disk failure to bring down the entire system. Furthermore, it is also possible that disks, disk sectors may develop a fault. So typically hardware techniques called sector sparing can fix this. In this case, what happens is that hardware internally maintains a few free sectors in, in a disk. So the moment a disk sector starts showing a fault, the contents of the previous sector are copied to the free sector and then uh, the same disk address the cluster address which was mapping to the previous cluster right so in this case it's at the cluster level but of course if the disk does not support clusters it will do it at the sector level but then the disk will not uh, 
give the feeling that this mapping has been done. So regardless of cluster or sector, the idea is that whatever is the logical address that points to the sector, uh, the same address internally via a remapping table will point to the new physical location. And so basically from outside, we'll not be able to make out a difference. So this of course is done at the hardware level when we are dealing with sectors, but a cluster mind you can have two raised to the power k sectors. So at the software level also, we can do something quite similar, which is when we suspect or when we start seeing these ECC errors uh, starting to happen in uh, sectors, we can make a guess that look, this part of the disk may fail in the future. So we can do a cluster remapping at the software level. Of course, it can't be sector remapping because the smallest storage unit is a cluster, but this can be done at the software level, which means that we will just change the virtual to physical mapping. Virtual is the cluster number and the physical is the disk address. So this mapping quite similar to what we do in virtual memory. The same thing can be done for disk for the disk to ensure better fault tolerance. So the FT disk driver will do all of these things. And uh, given the fact that this has been around for quite some time, it's reasonably stable. The file system in addition supports compression, right? It has native support for compression. So basically NTFS would divide a file's data into compression, into compression units, which is nothing but a block of 16 contiguous clusters. And then it will compress them. And let's say if a file is sparse, sparse basically means there's a lot of zeros in the file. What NTFS can do is that it can clusters that contain all zeros. You can just, you know, have a, uh, you, you know, you can, you can have a high label table which says that, look, a given cluster has all zeros, so it need not be stored. And then uh, basically only the virtual cluster numbers that have non-zero entries will get stored. So whenever we read a file and we find a gap in the virtual cluster number, we will figure out that, look, the virtual cluster number has not been stored because these clusters actually have zero valued entries. So then automatically we will infer the same and this information will be shared with whoever wants to read the file. So what is the key point? Well, we consider a large file, we divide it into clusters. Some of these clusters could have zero valued entries. So these clusters will not be stored in the MFT. Instead, the non-zero clusters, which don't have zero valued entries will be stored in the MFT. So the MFT will store these. So now what we will do is that when we are reading the MFT for a file, the MFT is a master file table, and we see that there are no entries for these clusters, we'll automatically figure out that, look, uh, the entries are not there because they contain all zeros. And then, of course, uh, we can, uh, if let's say, uh, there was a system call to read the contents of these memory regions, these file regions. We can just uh, return all zeros. The file system also supports something called reparse points. So a reparse point is basically like this, that let us say, so let's consider a directory. So instead of a front slash, we have a backslash and windows. So let us say it is dir1 slash dir2, sorry old Unix habit, dir2, dir3. So the directory dir2 could be a reparse point in the sense when you try to access it for the first time, an error code will be returned. So the IO manager can take a look at the error code and can figure out that look, dir2 is not supposed to be within my file system. It is supposed to be a mount point for some other file system. So the same way that we store all of this information in Linux in the etc directory, this information is also stored in Windows. And uh, so then Windows will know that for this reparse point, which files or which directories or which devices have to be accessed. And then it will create a mount point over here. Furthermore, it is possible that we may move 
some files to offline storage or to other devices. So it is possible dynamically to move sections of the file system to offline storage. Or you know to you can change the storage device so Windows can detect that as well and again generate an error for a reparse point and then if we have an error handler defined for it which means that instead of looking at the default location look for the file somewhere else that can also be done. So this finishes the file system part of Windows. We will now look at the networking components of Windows 10. So this is also quite elaborate in the sense Windows 10 supports both regular peer-to-peer -peer networking and client-server networking as well. Along with that, it has facilities for advanced network management. So it has two network interfaces. They are known as NDIS and TDI. So NDIS stands for Network Device Interface Specification and TDI stands for the Transport Driver Interface. So the interface specification essentially implements a part of the OSI model or the network stack, which we have seen earlier. So the idea is to separate the network adapters, which is pretty much the Mac layer, right? The file layer is always inside the card. This separates the Mac layer from the actual transport protocols so that one can be changed without the other, right? Uh, so, so this implements a separation. And then the TDI or the transport driver interface essentially implements the session layer. So the session layer, as you know, is layer number five. So this implements, uh, you know, this has the notion of sessions, particularly when uh, uh, two networking elements are trying to communicate. So this enables the session layer, which is also the primary role of the operating systems. If you actually think about it, uh, in, if you look at the top three layers of the OSI model, which is the application layer, the presentation layer, and the session layer. So the presentation layer is also a job of the OS, but it's more a job of the networking libraries. Uh, so the OS's main job is, number one, to enforce the abstractions of the OSI model, the seven-layer OSI model, which is done by NDIS. And for TDI, it is mainly to implement the session layer on top of TCP if that is the transport layer protocol. So this is done by the session layer component, right? And uh, uh, so this uses any available transport mechanism, which means any available layer four protocol, right? Whatever is currently available, uh, th that is used. So the transport protocols, so in general, almost all OSS, their main uh, the, the main implementation is between layer 3 and 5, where layer 3 is typically IP, layer 4 is TCP. Layer 4 is typically TCP or UDP, and layer 5 is the session layer. So, typically OSS would implement these. So the main idea is, to, uh, is that Windows 7 has very good support for all kinds of networking protocols. It also has drivers for each protocol that can be loaded and unloaded from the system dynamically. So the networking protocols that we are looking at, uh, some of them are like this. So one such protocol is known as the server message block or the SMB protocol, which is used to send IO requests over the network. So this is particularly very important because we send uh, these messages to a bunch of IO devices such as printers and so on. So it has four message types. The first is, of course, session control, which I have already discussed is an important part of any operating system, right? And then, of course, uh, we have uh, other things. So for example, to support remote file systems, uh, to have mounted file systems over the network, we have file-related messages. We have printer-related messages, and we have generic message classes. Similarly, we have the NetBIOS system, which is a it's an hardware abstraction for networks. So this is also supported as a part of one of the protocols. It is used to establish logical names on the network. Logical connection of sessions across machines on the network. So Windows has its own Active Directory system where we can identify messages. We have a network neighborhood, which all of you can see. 
So that will show you all the machines on the network. So most of the time there will be Windows machines, but they could be non-Windows machines as well. If particularly Linux machines have exposed file systems over the Samba protocol, so that, all, that also will be shown. So then of course we can have a reliable data transfer for a session via either these net BIOS uh, requests or via SMBs that we have discussed. So Windows of course does use TCP IP quite heavily in the sense it has support for the earlier version of IP, it has support for the newer version of IPv6. So it is clearly one of the biggest users of networking because anybody who uses Windows, they use it on a laptop or a desktop, which requires heavy use of networking. But Windows also has its own protocols, which also run on its own ports for a bunch of uh, other things. So because Windows is fast moving into a cloud and server operating system as well. So it has the point to point tunneling protocol uh, so basically this is primarily used to communicate between remote access server modules in the sense there is a client and a server and the server is let's say providing some feature right. So then a special protocol is defined for that for accessing remote servers. There are other protocols for accessing IBM mainframes, HP printers and so on. So there are a bunch of protocols. So since Windows interacts with a large number of devices and many over the network, over the years, tons and tons of network protocols especially have been developed. So one of the key aspects of a Windows system in today's world is access to a remote file. Why? Because, you know, we typically have small machines such as laptops and we have big file servers which essentially host all our files. So these are like internal clouds, right? Uh, internal clouds internal to an institute, university, uh, company and so on. So the application will call the IO manager to request that a file be opened. So every file name will have a standard format which will sort of give the name of the file and also which machine it belongs to or which logical volume it belongs to. Then the IO manager will immediately figure out where the file resides. It will send an IO request package. From the name of the file, so typically, you know, in Windows, we use this as host name. And then based on the directories that the host exports, we again have uh, the root directory that the host exports and then the path within it. So the moment it sees something of this nature, it will figure out that, look, it's on a remote machine. So it will call a driver called a multiple universal naming convention provider, which will tell it, you know, that in fact it's in the remote machine and where exactly it is. So it will send IO request packets to redirectors, where a redirector can satisfy the remote request. Uh, so furthermore, it will also cache the information that which redirector it had sent a request to such that if we request for the same file once again, we will know automatically where to send the request. Furthermore, now what the redirector will do, so from the client it has gone to the redirector, it will send the message over the network to the remote system, let's call that the server. The network drivers on the remote system will request, uh, will receive the request, figure out that it's for a file. They will hand it to the server, which will hand it over to the local file system. The local file system will again be loaded with the proper device driver, which is for that file system. We'll check for permissions and everything. And the results will be returned back to the server driver, which will again send it back to the redirector, which will send it back to the client. So given the fact that we are looking at, you know, groups of machines, we are looking at distributed systems, Windows uses the concept of networking domains. So the idea is that, you know, something similar to LDAP in Linux, if we have a bunch of machines, let's say in a lab, and I would like to log in from any machine. So I just go to a machine, I log in, I will get to see my files and everything. So for seeing my files, we could have like, you know, one big file server and then that could export a shared directory to all the machines. But what about login credentials? 
So it uses the notion of a domain to manage global access rights by creating groups of users. So a domain is basically defined as a group of machines that run Windows. They share a common set of users and a common set of security policies. So essentially, if I authenticate myself to the domain, then the entire system should work. So there are three ways that trust relationships are set within a domain. One is that we have a one-way trust relationship in the sense A trusts B, right? So basically, in this case, A would be the client and all clients would trust the server. There could be a two-way transitive where A would trust B, B would trust C, right? So then A, B, and C would then end up uh, trusting each other, of course, in a transitive fashion. And, and also two-way, in the sense A trusts B and B, tr uh, B trusts A. So this is more like a peer-to-peer -peer kind of setting. And then we could have a cross-link. So the idea is that, so this is like a shortcut between two domains where we don't use the existing hierarchy within the domain, but we sort of create a shortcut between domain ones and domain two where these machines trust each other. So this can be established with tokens and uh, tokens and so on. So of course, there are a bunch of other mechanisms that Windows now supports that includes Linux like Kerberos based authentication. But these are, I mean, I mean that would uh, sort of fall in the same uh, A trust B kind of scenario, but we could have a two way Kerberos as well. But th these are basically speaking the broad uh, contours of trust in a networking Windows networking domain. So when we come to the traditional TCP IP naming resolution, there is no great surprise over here in the sense the host names are converted to IP addresses. Windows itself has several naming mechanisms. It has an internet uh, name service of its own known as WINS. It also supports the DNS name resolution system, a broadcast based system. We can further create files the same way we can have a file called etsy hosts in Linux to basically store this mapping of domain names with IP addresses. We can do the same in Windows as well, where we can create a host file or an LM host file to uh, essentially store the mapping between uh, domain names uh, and IP addresses. So this will override whatever other servers give. So we can specify a preference order. So uh, furthermore, the WINS service, which is the Windows Internet Name Service, can maintain a dynamic mapping or a dynamic database of name to IP address bindings. And furthermore, client software can query them. So this is like a substitute for DNS. And then Windows uh, also supports static IPs and also dynamic IPs based on the DHCP protocol. So as I said, uh, there is no great uh, surprise over here in the networking subsystem. And uh, other than the fact that Windows has its own internet naming service called WINS, uh, other than that, the rest is standard and very similar features are provided in Linux as well. Now let's come to the last part, which was the programmer interface, which is how does the programmer or a program or an application access features of the kernel object because the kernel itself shows itself as an object. So let's say that, so it's not the entire kernel, but uh, you know, different parts of the kernel will, you know, kind of present themselves as different objects. So let's say that there is a kernel object named XXX. So we can create a handle to the object by the create XXX function, create thread or create process or whatever. Furthermore, we can open the handle and as well as we can close the handle. And the moment that there are no other pointers to the handle in the sense that uh, uh, nobody is pointing to the specific handle, then and the counter processes will reach zero and then a reference to it can be deleted. Furthermore, as we have discussed in one of the early slides of lecture one, a child process can inherit a handle to the object in the sense it can inherit it from its parent. And one process can also give the object a name when it is created. And this name can be passed to the second process which can open the object using the same name. 
Furthermore, we can also duplicate a handle, right? This will hold for any kernel object. So just I stand corrected in the sense that the entire kernel is not an object, but the kernel would in expose things like processes, semaphores, skews, mutexes, threads, and so on. Each of them is a kernel object, and they will all be handled in the same way. In the sense, we will create them and open a handle, close a handle. So what we are discussing right now is a duplicate handle function. If we are given a handle to a process and the handle's value, uh, we can duplicate the handle and provide the handle to a second process. So in this case, the count will get incremented by one. It is this count. So both the processes have to relinquish the handle for the object handle, object's handle, or even the object itself in some cases to be deleted. With regards to process management, we have already seen the create family of calls. A process is started by the create process routine, which will also load any dynamic link libraries, which are also called DLLs. DLLs are called shared objects in Linux. Uh, that will create the primary thread. And then additional threads will be created by the create thread function, where the logic is the same. We send a function pointer to whatever function needs to be executed as a separate thread. Furthermore, it is possible, uh, it's just not possible, it's very common that within an executable file known as an exe in Windows, so Windows has .exe files, it also has .bat files, which are batch files or scripts, something which similar to .sh in Linux. So every DLL can be loaded into the address space of a process. And this is done by an instance handle whose job is quite similar to Linux, take a DLL and load its core and data within a process's address space. So Windows has several scheduling classes. So we have discussed that. We have discussed 32 scheduling classes. So let us look at them once again. So clearly the lowest ones are the idle classes, which don't do much. Then we have a below normal priority class, which are mainly for background jobs, right? You know, if you have the time, execute them. Otherwise, you may defer. So these have the anti priority level 6. Then we have the normal priority class, which is level 8 for most normal processes, and an above normal class, level 10, for a few processes that we consider important, level 13 for high priority classes, and level 24 and also above for real time processes. So Windows has some additional features for interactive programs. So Windows has a special scheduling uh, rule or a special scheduling scheme for processes that are in the normal priority class, yet they are interactive. So here a distinction is made between the foreground process, which is currently executing on the screen, and you know, has a graphical interface, users are interacting with it and so on, as opposed to a batch mode background process. So when a process moves into the foreground, what happens, or let's say when it becomes interactive, its scheduling quantum is increased in the sense it is given more processor time, typically by a factor, which is 3x. So let's say previously within a large interval, if it was getting alpha units of time, now it will get three alpha units of time just because it became a foreground process. So furthermore, the kernel would be dynamically adjusting the priority of threads depending upon whether they are IO bound or CPU bound. In addition, uh, synchronization plays an important role in the sense kernel does keep, uh, does have a lot of routines for synchronization, which is uh, the concurrent accesses in this by different threads for a semaphore or a mutex. So threads can have very complicated ways of synchronizing. So one of the new features in Windows is wait for multiple objects in the sense that instead of waiting for a single object, we wait for a multiple we wait for a set of objects till all of them are free. So the key point is that we want to provide a degree of fairness such that if one process needs multiple objects, it will actually get it within a bounded period of time. So all of these things are built into uh, the Windows scheduler. So you don't really have to take lock sequentially and then you know kind of get delayed or get into a deadlock or something. So there is a there is a 
there is an inherent natural method of just getting multiple logs at the same time. So, and of course, uh, you know, this is part of the older Win32 API where critical sections are all natively supported. So now let's look at uh, something called a fiber, which is user mode code, which gets scheduled on the basis of a user defined scheduling algorithm. So in this sense, we can override the preferences that are being made by the system level scheduler instead we can use the user level scheduler to do the scheduling. So of course, one such, uh, so this is known as a fiber, right, which is an user mode code, but only one such fiber process is permitted to execute even on multiprocessor hardware. So the advantage of fibers is to port legacy Unix applications that are written for a fiber execution model where we have control over the scheduling so we have seen something quite similar in Linux also where you know small modifications are made and we call that a personality of a process for supporting or being compatible with different Unix versions. So in Windows also to support old legacy applications, they need to include all of these features, which may be rarely used, but a lot of clients, particularly enterprise clients would be having many such applications, which they would not really like to port. So Windows has now also introduced some user mode scheduling for 64-bit systems, which allows a much finer grain control again for you know, these large pieces of software with a lot of threads, where the writer of the software knows the requirements of the software much better as opposed to the kernel. So the kernel can give it a set of resources, a set of hardware resources, compute resources like CPUs, and the writer of the software can then write uh, her own scheduling algorithm. So for user mode scheduling, what needs to be done is like this, that we'll have a user mode scheduler with a set of user thread completion lists. All right, so this is the user part and this is the kernel part. So what happens is, so the key, Component here is the user mode scheduler, which is a user mode process, which has registered itself with the kernel as a user mode scheduler. This basically means that the moment it creates a set of threads, they also get registered with the kernel. The kernel creates the, you know, the mirroring kernel threads. So let's say that one of the threads UT0 uh, has, is executing, but it traps. The moment it traps, it goes to the kernel. So the kernel then basically blocks thread zero. But the point is that in, a, in the case of a regular execution, what it would have actually done is that it would have scheduled some other thread on the CPU core. But in this case, that will not happen. This information will be, con will be conveyed to the user mode scheduler that thread will then pick some other thread to execute. So this decision is not made by the kernel, is made by the user mode scheduler, which will then pick thread UT1, and then that thread will start executing. So the only thing that the kernel does is that it maintains a list of all the kernel mode threads. So it's known as parking, in the sense that they are, you, you know, it just keeps tabs on the kernel mode threads. And as and when a thread either gets blocked or it finishes, user mode thread is uh, informed and if it finishes then of course the thread goes into the ut user thread completion list so the point of making a decision on which thread to run next is outsourced to a user mode process so now coming to inter process communication so between the uh, so Win32 applications can have a lot of ipc so ipc you know is very richly supported in windows 10. And so we share kernel objects and the kernel objects are used to affect the inter-process communication. So the other is to use message passing. So we have already talked about it slightly in the case of, uh, uh, you know, deferred procedure calls, sorry, local procedure calls, where a thread can send a message to another thread or to a window. And it can also send some data along with that. So every Win32 thread thus needs its own input queue, 
mainly because you know we are looking at a system where we can have a lot of graphics and lot of interaction so this is where it is good for a thread to have its own input queue where other threads can kind of deposit their messages and then this thread can then receive messages from them so this is something that is natively supported and this is not there in linux mainly because linux is made for a different kind of an application mix and windows is made for a different kind of an application mix so of course on 16 bit windows there was a single input queue and that was a sequential bottleneck so this is clearly more reliable in the sense you know you will not have convoy blocking in this in this case one application blocking the rest of the applications so this is a very quick way of passing messages particularly in a graphics oriented or a graphical windowing system where messages have to be quickly sent between windows which basically translates to messages between processes regarding memory management uh, we have the functions virtual alloc to reserve or commit virtual memory and virtual free to decommit or release the virtual memory that has been allocated in the in the past furthermore we can enable the application to determine the virtual address at which you know memory has been allocated and what needs to be done with it furthermore we can memory map the contents of a file quite similar to what we have seen uh, earlier as well so here the key point is that this is internally a multi stage process where of course a file has to be opened and so on and then we'll have to reserve space in virtual memory and copy the contents of the file to virtual memory maybe not all of it but some part which is going to be accessed and then again if we want to be smart if let's say the threads are reading the early part of the file and with a high likelihood we can guess that the rest of the file will also be read we can have a prefetching engine to prefetch the rest of the blocks so this itself is a complicated module or a subsystem in itself where we can increase the performance quite a bit so the key idea over here is that uh, this uh, you know is clearly a multi stage process and uh, this has been optimized so that is why uh, this is a point i have always made that if two processes want to send data to each other ports sockets message queues and so on are still inefficient mechanisms the best mechanism is of course a shared memory region or a memory mapped file so both of them are the fastest so coming to a heap a heap in the win32 environment is basically a region of is a reserved address space so every process is given a 1 mb default heap where all of the dynamically allocated uh, data structures such as malloc and new they all get stored over here and uh, it is possible so the heap is shared uh, between multiple threads unlike the stack the heap region of a process is shared by multiple threads so of course they can access it and they can dynamically increase and you know decrease its size and call malloc and free calls so a fair amount of synchronization is required and that degree of synchronization is provided furthermore because of the requirement of uh, data particularly per thread data as well as global data uh, that is required in a multi threaded environment there is a tls or a thread local storage mechanism which is provided to the threads to allocate some storage which is of course globally accessible but the storage belongs to every thread right it's on a per thread basis such that everything doesn't really have to be stored on the stack so if a thread wants it can access data which is like you know think of it as a private heap so because what is the advantage of a dynamically allocated piece of memory that it survives function calls it survives function returns so something similar can be done of course at a thread private level known as tls where you can think of it as a local heap for a thread so this will provide both you know dynamic and static methods of creating thread local storage so this completes uh, chapter 21 which was the chapter on windows